What's going on guys? This is Brian from Advancement Hockey Advising here and today we'll be talking about the NCAA Eligibility Center and how it applies to hockey players. But before we dive in here, just a quick reminder to absolutely smash that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell and share the video. And if you have any questions or anything you want to talk to us about throughout the entire video, feel free to either drop a comment down below or email us at info at ahadvising.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And last quick thing, like with all our videos here, there will be timestamps throughout the video. So if you want to go to a specific section, you can. If you want to just stay here and just watch the entire video too, you can too. It's completely up to you. All right, so diving in here, let's just start with what is the NCAA Eligibility Center? Well, all it is is just a little platform that you use. You go online, you log in, create an account, and from there it just asks you a series of questions. And how exactly does it work? Well, it asks you basically on um, you know academic eligibility questions. So it'll ask your GPA, SAT score, stuff like that. It'll also ask you non-academic questions as well. So like you know, have you ever gambled? Have you ever taken performance enhancing drugs? and so on, right? So that's kind of like the basic questions that it's gonna ask you and that's what it's kind of looking for, for your eligibility. Now I know this whole process sounds a bit standard, doesn't sound like the funnest thing to do, right? But we're talking about it here because it is extremely important and I can't stress how important that this process is. It can literally dictate the difference between you actually playing NCAA hockey and you not being eligible to play and you not playing, right? So it's extremely, extremely important and it's something that you should really approach you know, with a lot of attention to detail and really make sure you answer the questions and fill out everything the way you need to and really make sure that you prepare the right way, you do the right things in order for you to, you know, not get any uh, red flags or roadblocks down the road. So, and that's kind of the whole point of this video, the whole inspiration behind it is to just, you know, allow you to be better informed, to know exactly what to expect of it, exactly uh, what you can do to best prepare for it and make sure that you get no red flags down the road. But trust me on this here, if you follow our advice here to T, especially if you're early in the game, you know, you shouldn't run into any problems. So it's really important. Take a look at this video, take down some notes if you need to, and just follow this advice in T and you should be all set. All right, so a quick breakdown of the video here of all the things that we're gonna talk about. There's gonna be five main sections. First is, who does this advice apply to? Second is non-academic eligibility. Third is gonna be academic eligibility. Fourth is going to be uh, what players who are still in high school should do, the steps they need to take. And then fifth and finally is going to be uh, what players who graduated high school, so guys who are playing junior hockey or whatnot, what they should do. All right, so let's start off with number one, who this applies to. Well, short answer is essentially, it basically applies to every hockey player that's trying to go uh, the collegiate route at the NCAA level. Now, you know, at the NCAA D1 and D2 level, this is where we see the NCAA Eligibility Center coming into play. NCAA D2, as we all know, is pretty much irrelevant in hockey. You know, there are some programs that are NCAA D2, but it's very rare. And it's not typically what we focus on here, so we're going to kind of toss those aside for a bit. Um, it's more the NCAA D1 level that we want to talk about here. You know, um, NCAA uh, D1, you have to go through this eligibility process to compete. If you don't do it, you won't be able to compete at the NCAA D1 level. That's just a fact. So it's something that you have to go through if you're trying to go D1. If you're trying to go NCAA D3, you don't technically have to do this, okay? You don't have to worry about this process. That being said though, most NCAA D3 programs do do similar processes of this. They follow similar rules and similar guidelines. So I would say even if you're, you know, destined to just go NCAA D3, which I never really want to tell players, you know, it, still complete this process, you know, still do all the steps that we're going to talk about here to, um, you know, take your SAT, ACT, you know, get a good grade point average because it's going to help you out in the D3 process as well. And bonus here you know for d3 schools especially a lot of the scholarships they give out are academic based and how you do in your high school courses and how you do on your sat or act that will impact how much scholarship money you get so altogether it's just a good idea to just do well on these and for the non-academic stuff too you know the d3 level they almost look at the exact same stuff too so long story short anyone who wants to play the collegiate level this uh, this advice applies and you should definitely pay attention and write down some notes. All right, so moving on to number two here, which is the section of non-academic eligibility. So there's a, those are probably the first questions that you're gonna get on the NCAA Eligibility Center platform. Basically, they're gonna ask you questions like, have you ever taken performance enhancing drugs? 
you know, have you ever uh, competed at a professional level? Have you ever got played for or paid for your athletic abilities, right? If you answer no to all these, which most of, most of you won't encounter any problems, you'll be all set, right? You won't have to worry about that. You should pass, you know, with flying colors and, you know, no worries, right? But for some of you that may answer a few, you know, red flag questions, we call them. If you get flagged for any questions, you know, especially if it's more than one, you'll probably have to speak um, with an NCAA representative, right? You're, pro you're probably going to have a follow-up meeting here where you have to kind of explain your situation and all that stuff. You Typically, you know, we see this happen with players that kind of went to major junior camps or stuff like that. You know, it's a big gray area in hockey. So if you kind of played on the edge, you know, you might not encounter any issues or you might also get flagged and have to speak to someone and explain your case. You know, either or, if that happens to you, just explain your case well and you shouldn't encounter any issues. That being said though, it's important to keep some really golden rules in mind just to avoid any issues whatsoever because these are things you don't want to deal with unless you really have to. All right, so the golden rules are, they're, they're pretty obvious here, but don't take any performance enhancing drugs, right? Just don't do it. There are some nuances sometimes with this, you know, like caffeine intake, a certain amount, you know, it could be, uh, it could be flagged or something like that. And there's a couple other weird ones, but for the most part, we all know, just don't take performance enhancing drugs, right? It's just not really good for your health and it's just not, you know, you can't take those to play NCAA hockey. Next, you know, don't get paid to play hockey, right? I, and I know here there's a gray area with, um, you know, certain things, but for the most part here, don't get paid for your athletic abilities, all right? Don't gamble, you know, that's a big one that a lot of players miss sometimes. Uh, don't do any illegal activities or have a criminal record, right? If that happens to you, uh, chances are you're gonna get barred for, from entering NCAA competition. So really important, you know, nothing crazy like that. And last but not least too, be wary of the major junior process. This is unique to hockey players uh, compared to other student athletes in other sports, right? This one, I would say, uh, really be careful of it. You know, we made a video uh, titled NCAA versus Major Junior, right? Definitely go check that out if you're kind of, you know, debating on going to Major, ju major Junior camps or your Major Junior uh, draft dates coming up or all, all that kind of stuff. Definitely check that video out. We have really specific rules that we highlight here, like the do's and don'ts. So it's really important to know that. So be weary of that whole process if you're trying to go in that field. So, but those are the golden rules to keep in mind. You know, it's just common sense after that, at that point. And just don't do anything blatantly terrible that's going to, you know, potentially bar you from playing NCAA competition. All right, so let's move on to number three here, which is academic eligibility. I would say probably the most important part in this whole video here. And you know, for some parents, it does seem kind of confusing initially, but trust me, we're going to try and make it as simple as possible here and break it down for you. So the first thing you have to remember here, and probably the most important, is that you need a minimum, a bare minimum of a 2.3 core course GPA. Okay, 2.3 GPA. What's a core course? We're gonna get to that in a sec, but real quick, a 2.3 core course GPA is the minimum standard that you need. From there, once you have your 2.3 GPA met in high school, it kind of goes on a sliding scale with your SAT or ACT score. Now, what do I mean by a sliding scale? So basically, what that is, is that the higher your GPA, the lower you can afford your SAT or ACT score to be, to be eligible, right? The lower your GPA, granted doesn't go below 2.3, okay? The higher you need your SAT or ACT score to be, okay? Hopefully that makes sense for you. So it's kind of a sliding scale depending on how high your GPA is, how high your SAT or ACT score is. Now, just keep this in mind, this is the bare minimum you need to get in, right? Some programs like Ivy League schools, you know, you need to have high GPAs and high SAT or ACT scores to get in, right? It's just how it works. But, you know, just to get in, just to pass the NCAA Eligibility Center, it kind of goes on the sliding scale here. If you want specific numbers, there's a link down in the description below for this and all the other, you know, academic eligibility stuff and non-academic eligibility stuff. There's a link in the description. It'll give you all the information in detail that you need. And you can kind of use a simulation of the sliding scale of to, to see exactly where you stand to see if you're eligible based on your scores. All right, so backtracking to what I said a while ago here about core courses, right? Core course is another you know confusing part for some parents and they kind of trip a couple people up but it's actually really simple you need 16 core course credits all right and then from there each 
core course counts for one credit. So let's say you take a class of English, all right, in ninth grade, that's one core course credit, okay? And you need 16 of those. Now, what counts as core courses? Well, anything language like English, French, Spanish, anything like that, any creative writing class, you know, stuff like that where you write and all that, you know, if you do like novels like Shakespeare, that's probably gonna be in English, but you know, you get the gist, right? Anything that's language like that is a core course. Many math classes, if not all math classes, I would say like algebra, geometry, statistics, you know, functions, advanced functions, calculus, all that kind of stuff counts as a core course as well. Sciences, for the most part, like the hard or the natural sciences, you can go into, if I'm not mistaken, like just basic science, right? Ninth grade and 10th grade, um, biology, chemistry, physics, all that kind of stuff. And then classes like history, uh, political science, you know, government, stuff like that. Uh, religion classes too, they count as well. You know, so there's a ton of options here that you can choose from to pick your course credits. Usually there, there's no problem if you really look at the guidelines. And if you want more info on this, what class specifically, again, the link in the description below, is gonna give you all the list of all the details that you need. Just stuff to look out for here that's not a core course. Stuff like art, music, you know, gym, all these kinds of things don't count as a core course. So that's really important to keep in mind. And just really important to keep in mind to just have 16 of those credits on your transcript. That's all you need to know for this. And backtracking a bit more, remember when I said minimum GPA of 2.3, it was the minimum core course GPA of 2.3, right? The NCAA doesn't care about your other courses that don't count as core courses. They only care about your GPA of your 16 core uh, course credits that you have. And last quick part about academic eligibility here is that throughout this pandemic, there have been adjustments made from the NCAA here. Now for the 2021, 2022 and the 2022 and 2023 years, so the next couple academic years here, uh, the SAT and the A or the ACT, they won't be required, okay? The NCAA kind of lifted that because there's been challenges for testing uh, for because of the pandemic, right? That being said though, you know, I still highly suggest hockey players um, in particular, they take the SAT or the ACT because a lot of, if NCAA D1 doesn't work out for you and you go NCAA D3, a lot of NCAA D3 programs still will require this, okay? And they'll still use your scores um, for, for scoring purposes to see, you know, what you're gonna, if you're gonna get in, first of all, and then second of all, how much scholarship money you're gonna receive. So we really strongly suggest hockey players to take it especially because hockey players right you don't just go uh, straight from high school to ncaa usually right you play junior years chances are when it comes time for you to apply in your application cycle these measures the sat or the act are going to be back um you know they're going to be mandatory again even at the ncaa d1 level so for multiple reasons hockey players you know unless you're 20 years old right now and you're going ncaa d1 i would say for most of you guys really still plan on taking the sat or the act we work with a company called eprep you can go through them they're a great test prep company they're really cheap too if you want to go with another company you can but definitely prepare for this sat or act and get a good score it's very very important all right so let's move on to the fourth point in this video here and that is what you know players that are still in high school what they should do well i got some good news for you if you're watching this and you're still in high school it means you still have a ton of time left and you can still you know if you're missing core courses or anything like that you can still you know make changes which is huge it's much easier than when you're not so that's a huge thing the first step I typically recommend players, if you haven't done so already, create an NCAA um, eligibility center account, kind of scope it out, see what it's asking, get used to the platform, you know, and do your research to see, um, you know, what it's all about and all these different things. So watching this video, for example, is doing your research on it. The next thing I would suggest, especially if you're on the younger spectrum of the high school age, I would say um, definitely, you know, meet with your academic counselor at some point and talk about all the core courses that you need to take, kind of map them out, tell them what you need to take, why you need to take it, right? Especially if you're Canadian, you know, academic counselors don't have that much experience to guide you. So definitely you're gonna have to take the reins on this. Make sure you take all the core courses that you need to kind of have a plan put together. That's the second thing I would do. And if you're in like grade 12 or say, you know, make sure that if you're missing core courses, you take them, you know, immediately. You talk to your academic counselor as soon as you can and you get them into your curriculum, right? Because it's really, really important to have 16 credits in there. 
Next, the next thing I would do is if you haven't taken it already, take the SAT or ACT, right? Really important, definitely prep for it well, but you know, find a time to prep for it and then find a time to take it, very important. If you've already taken it and you need to retake it, definitely do that, right? The higher your score, you can take it as many times as you want, the higher your score, the better off you're gonna be overall. So really, you know, if the score is kind of lackluster or mediocre, definitely consider retaking it. Next, I would also, you know, advise to just do the best you can in your high school courses, right? If you get good grades in your courses, that just saves headaches down the road and it gives you a bunch more opportunities. So definitely, you know, do the best you can since you still are in control, right? Since you're still in high school, you have the control to do, to have great grades. So definitely get as good a grades as you possibly can. And last quick thing here, you know, do your best on the ice right try and develop as much as you can try and get as many coaches uh, attention as possible right at the NCAA level and all that stuff it's really important obviously to get recruited and uh, yeah you just do the best you absolutely can to develop and to get noticed and also you know for all the non-academic eligibility stuff you know just avoid all of those right follow the golden rules and you should be all set all right, now moving on to what players who already graduated high school should do, right? So guys that are playing junior hockey for the most part. First thing I have to advise you is if you haven't created an NCAA eligibility account yet, definitely create one, right? Definitely get on there. Definitely, you know, if at this point you've probably taken your SAT or ACT, hopefully you have. If you have, you know, go and enter all your scores, your grades, answer all the questions and get, you know, that certificate. It's it's very important to get that as quick as you can because if you if you haven't done it, if you show if you show coaches that you don't have the certificate yet, you haven't done it for whatever reason, they might see you as unprofessional and they they might, you know, kind of shy away from you if you haven't done it, right? Now, if you're a great hockey player, they're going to kind of guide you through it if uh, if you haven't done it, but, you know, just do yourself a favor and create an account and get it done as soon as you can. Next, if you're creating the account, you know, hmm, I have a core course GPA that's below 2.3 or there's core courses that I haven't taken yet, take those as soon as you can, right? Try and try and find a way to take them, you know, call your school, your high school up that you went to or another school, you know, try and get the, those courses in as soon as you can because you will not be able to compete at the NCAA D1 level, you know, if you haven't done those. So very, very important to get those done if you haven't already. Next is if you haven't taken the SAT or ACT already, take it, it's very important, right? Especially, you know, even if you have three years of juniors left that even two years, let's say that you're expecting uh, to have well even then, let's say you wait till the absolute last minute to take your SAT or ACT, you take it and your score isn't good enough, right, to, to get past the NCAA eligibility center, well then you're in trouble, right? So you definitely wanna take it as early as you can, right? In case you don't get a great score, you can kinda, you know, uh, take a step back, learn, uh, adapt, and try and increase your score from there, you have time. So time is your friend here. So really important, if you haven't taken it already, absolutely take it as soon as you can, granted that you have a dedicated study period before taking it. Now the next point here, really, you know, pay attention to this one, it's really important because some players do miss this and it can cost your eligibility here for a year or more, right? And that's not to enroll in full-time classes when you're playing junior hockey. Really, really important. Now what I mean, full-time classes at the university level. If you're missing core courses or something like that, the high school level, that's fine. But university level, do not go full-time. Only go independent studies part-time, right? Very, very, very important okay, or else it can cost you eligibility. So what we typically recommend to players, you know, depending on how busy their schedule is, if they're working or not, we say one to two classes a semester, you know, something like that. Some players opt to take three, it can be risky with some, I, I typically say one to two classes, that should be enough with your junior hockey schedule. So that's what we typically recommend. Quick note though, if you're taking, you know, for a semester, you're planning on studying for the SAT or ACT, you know, because it takes about, I would say, two to four months, depending on the student. Um, I would say focus on that. Don't take part-time classes that semester or else you can kind of overwhelm yourself and you'll spread yourself too thin. You don't want to do that. So focus on that in the meantime. But at other semesters where you don't have that to worry about, Definitely, you know, one to two classes, something like that, but keep it part-time, keep it independent. Very important. And last but not least, like players who are still in high school, you know, do your best on the ice, do your best to get recruited, and avoid all the nonsense that could kind of, you know, sacrifice your non-academic eligibility, right? Do your best to follow these golden rules and you'll be all set. All right, so I know we covered a ton of info here in this video, and a lot of it is very important, so we're gonna do a pretty in-depth recap here to make sure that you take home all the key messages. Now, like I just said, the NCAA Eligibility Center is extremely important. It literally says it in the name, it determines your eligibility 
responsibility for NCAA hockey, right? So really important that you follow all these steps to a T to make sure you don't encounter any red flags or any problems and that you go play NCAA hockey without any hiccups. For non-academic eligibility, it's important to follow the golden rules here, which are, you know, don't gamble, don't do performance enhancing drugs, don't get paid for your athletic abilities, don't do any sketchy behavior, uh, illegal activity or criminal activity or have a criminal record or anything like that. And just be wary of the ju major junior process. Like I said before, we have a video that kind of covers that as well. All right, and now for academic eligibility, things to remember here, 16 core course credits that you need, right? A minimum GPA, a minimum core course GPA of 2.3. From there, once you have that minimum GPA and those 16 core course credits, uh, your SAT score or ACT score and your GPA kind of go on a sliding scale like we talked about. And last but not least, even though the pandemic technically says right now for the next two application cycles that you don't need to take the SAT or ACT for the NCAA eligibility standard, we strongly recommend for the reasons we talked about to take the SAT or ACT if you're a hockey player. And last quick thing, Remember to create your account and to submit your answers when the time comes for you. All right, guys, that's it for the video. But if you haven't already, just a quick reminder again to absolutely smash that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and share the video. And throughout this video, like we said again, if you have any questions, anything you want to talk about about this topic or anything else relating to hockey, feel free to comment down below or email us at info at ahadvising.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And quick thing too, if you want to check out more stuff about us like our Facebook, Instagram, you know, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff, you know, feel free to click that link down below that's going to give you access to all of it. And that is it guys. Thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video and we'll catch you on that next one.